Before I start, Caleb, can I have your watch? I didn't take a time. And uh, I can talk for a long time sometimes. So, just... Uh, thanks, buddy. All right, now I can at least uh, be aware of where I'm at. Um, yeah, good morning. Uh, Becky sends her highs. Uh, she is not with us this morning. Uh, I was telling them, um, I took some of the kids with me. Uh, she is at home. We have some other kids who are sick, and that usually happens because we have a whack of kids. Um, since the last time we were here, I was here in uh, April, um, we had our one daughter and her daughter, so our granddaughter, move out. And it's really awesome to see. It was great to have um, your granddaughter for a year in the house, but it's also really good to see, um, it was good to see Christy get on her feet and to uh, get to a place where she is able to be on her own with her daughter. So it was, uh, it was absolutely wonderful to see. But she moved out, and then we had two other youth move in. So we still are at... Uh, Quite a few kids. Our two oldest are in Prairie Bible College this year, and uh, one is um, Taya. She's going for uh, um, counseling, specializing in youth counseling, dealing with trauma. And then Isaac, who is the artist, a phenomenal artist, he is actually um, taking the encounter program. And then we have five of our kids here, and then the two youngest ones are at home, and then the middle two, um, one of them who moved in is going back to school. She's, uh, she's 19, and she's going back to grade 11, and uh, she's, uh, she's doing amazing. The other one graduated who moved in, and we're looking for full-time work for her. Uh, she transitions from uh, high school into adulthood. So it's a joy. We, um, some of the things, if you read the letter, um, we were in a time of discernment. It's uh, always fascinating to figure out where God wants us and what does life look like. Uh, ministry is always changing. You know, you're always in seasons, just like here, like in church. And so we spent um, a bunch of August and September trying to figure out where exactly God wants us. And the absolutely amazing thing is, is that it's still not any clear. <laughs> so we spent a fair bit of time, but as we go forward, I know I'm a firm believer that God won't actually show you your path. You take a step in faith, and as you take that step, that path is lit up. And then you take your next step. And if the door closes, the door closes. If not, then he wants us to go forward. So we just thank you for uh, an incredible uh, relationship with Anoka Sunrise. We value you guys' as prayers, your guys' as support. It, it means a lot to us. So with that, let's, uh, let's get into the word. Uh, we're going to start in Luke 10. Uh, Luke 10, 1 to 24. It's, I'm not sure if you guys have Bibles or if it's on the screen, but let's, uh, let's open up. Four, let's pray. Heavenly God, Father, we, uh, we thank you for this amazing day, Father, to be able to uh, remember your son's sacrifice for our salvation. Father, to be able to come together as believers and share in, in not just communion, Lord, but fellowship. I pray, Father, for your spirit's presence to be in this room, Father, to open our hearts, God, to open our minds. Father, to uh, feel the graceful conviction, Lord, as you direct us and you guide us closer to you, Father, resembling your son. Father, we love you. Father God, we thank you. We praise you. We come before you through Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a, uh, a little bit of a longer text, but uh, we'll get through most of it. So we're going to start Luke 10, starting in verse 1. Jesus sends out 72 messengers. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse, a bag, or sandals, and do not greet anyone, anybody along the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return back to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever you give, whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. 
When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God has come to, near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe off our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No. You will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. The 72 return. The 72 returned to, with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority on, to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, this, this is what you were pleased to do. All the things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and hear what you hear, but did not hear it. This is the word of the Lord. So there's a lot in these 24 verses. And Jesus has some awesome instruction. There's some great wisdom. But the chapters prior to Luke 10, which we weren't able to go through, kind of sets the stage for Luke 10. There's a bit of context and some, some nuances that start to shine through. Now, there is a lot loaded in this. There's a lot of deep theology. I could spend a whole sermon talking about what it means to be, what it means to be a man of peace. Or even, we'll touch a little bit on this, what does it mean to trample on snakes and scorpions? Or when did Jesus see Satan fall from heaven? But that's not what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about practical. I'm a practical theology kind of a guy. I look at something and I go, how can I apply this? And I think when we look at this, this passage practically, we understand a bit what it means to be a missional church. To start understanding missionally. First, to do that, uh, we have to put ourselves in the story, okay? We're going to pretend we're the one of the 72, all right? Now, imagine you're, you're with Jesus, and he says, all right, go. And as soon as he says go, he hits you with a whack of negative things, and there's no warm-up. You don't get to swing the bat. You don't get to, to throw the club around once or twice. He just goes, says go and hits you with all this negativity. He says, I'm sending you into a field, the harvest is ready, and there's not enough workers. I know what that feels like. When you're looking at a job that can never be finished, it is overwhelming. Ever been that? Where you're looking at, the more you put, you take like two steps forward, three steps back, and you're consistently always working. It's an impossible task. It weighs heavy on our shoulders. And then Jesus tells us, well... You not only do you have to work, I want you to pray, I want you to ask, and when you get more workers, I want you to train them. I'm a journeyman mechanic. I was born and raised, or born and raised, sorry. I was uh, born in the uh, hands or the trades um, field, or I guess not born. I'm a hands guy, I guess is the best way to put it. And I've trained quite a few apprentices. Your first year, your productivity is not there because you're spending a lot of time looking after the guy behind you. And your second year gets a little better, third year it's better, fourth year you're actually on par, the guy who you're training is doing the work of a mechanic and you're actually back to your productivity. But it takes four years. It takes a long time. Those who have businesses um, know what it's like. Training, it's a huge investment. These disciples were trained by Jesus for maybe a year, half a year, two years, 
They had the best trainer. And Jesus says, I want you to work and train. The other thing that is kind of alarming is Jesus says, go like lamb among wolves. What a picture, hey? He could have said like shepherds. He could have called them donkeys. He could have called them dogs, anything. But he called them lambs. Now, I often think about uh, being called a lamb is because lambs are helpless. What does a lamb do? Like if a wolf goes and attacks them, there's nothing it can do. Lambs need protection. My little girl started watching this little show called The Karate Lamb. I'm not sure if you've ever seen that. A wolf goes after this as a cartoon, and there's one lamb that protects everybody, the sheep, and, and it knows karate. But that's, that's like a cartoon. This isn't real life. It's like inviting them to an eating party, and they're the buffet. I think when Jesus describes a mission field like this, it's actually pretty scary. You're going to be overworked. You're going to be like lambs and just go. But the interesting thing is, is Jesus doesn't give the disciples an option. He says, go with an exclamation point. End of story. Go. There's no turning back. There's no arguing. He says, go. And then he tells us, take nothing. Now, there's a few different viewpoints on support and ministry. Um, but in this particular time, he's referring to what he had said in the chapter prior. He said, um, he says, foxes of holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. This is 9 verse 58. So this is like three verses prior to that. And Jesus says, take no money, take no clothes, take no food, absolutely nothing. If you couldn't tell, I like to eat. My wife is a good cook, and I know a lot of people like to eat also. But Jesus says, don't take any food, nothing. Now, there's even more to this. He talks about distraction. He says, do not greet anyone along the road. Now, I find that fascinating, but I think the only way that I can explain that and look at that is if we look at commentaries, is that when we greet somebody on the road, God, Jesus has a destination for us. He knows where he wants us to go and wants us to be. But every time we stop, we could get pulled off so easily. Oh, man, this person wants to have some help. This, could, this guy could be a robber, whatever. Or, you know, people are pulling us away from God's plan. God said, Jesus says, no, I want you there. Don't stop to talk to nobody. Then later on in, verse, or in chapter 10, it says in uh, verse 9, it says, uh, sorry, in verse 10, sorry, it says, when you enter town, you won't be welcomed. People don't want us in their community as Christians. And it doesn't say if you come to a town when you're not welcome. It says when. When. And then in 16, it says they're going to reject you. Now, there's various reasons of why people reject Christianity, why they reject missions. Like, there's, there's, there's a lot of them. But in this context, we've got to put ourselves in the Jewish audience, okay? So one of the things that Jewish people were is they were stoic. They were very much, this is the way we've done it. Jewish religion and tradition was the only tradition in this world that was passed on by God. That culture was the only culture that was given to a human race by God. And they knew that. So for 2,000 years, they have done things a certain way. Their ceremonies were done a certain way. Their sacrifices were done a certain way. All of this was done a certain way. And Jesus says, they're going to reject you. Now I get it, because... Prior to Jesus, in the like 50 years prior to Jesus, there was a lot of whack jobs that were out there that had some pretty crazy ideas. Now, every single one of them were all about rebelling against the Roman Empire, and guess what happened to the rebellion? They were squashed and killed. Jewish people knew that. They didn't want that. They did not want to be part of this new fad, this new idea, this new trend, because they didn't know who Jesus was, really. They didn't want to be part of it. They wanted to live. Now, despite all of this, Jesus still says, go. Now, that's scary. The disciples are facing a lot. Now, that was external. Those are external pressures. Let's look at internal stuff, internally. Now, later on, uh, in verse 20, Jesus says, do not rejoice if the Spirit submit to you. Jesus is uh, cautiously rebuking the disciples. The disciples were rejoicing over their control. Jesus was warning them. Pride sneaks into our hearts so easy, into our minds. Prior 
If we go back into the prior Luke 9, right, we just had the disciples arguing who is the greatest. Oh, I'm the greatest. I'm going to sit as right. No, I'm the greatest. And I don't know if there's fist fights. We have the, the sons of thunder. Um, they were kind of fighters. And I don't know if they broke out in fist fights, but they were definitely like pretty mad. But they were prideful people. And then right after that, um, it's still in chapter 9, there's uh, another guy who's driving demons out in Jesus' name. And the disciples were like, hey, who is this guy? Stop him. And Jesus is like, no. They were jealous. They were jealous people. Jesus saw their hearts and knew they had to be put in their place. Am I going in and out? The mic? I think my mic is going in and out. I can hear myself or not. But I'll try to stand still and I can use this one too as a backup. I'll try to stand still though. But if we put that in today's context... And we look at what Jesus is asking them to do. Who's, who's been involved in missions here? You don't have to raise your hand if you want to, but short-term, long-term missions. Some of us have been to, like, Mexico, um, even some maybe uh, some of the Red Deer um, uh, food places. Um, but we can relate what it's like. It's scary. It's not easy. And we can see what the disciples are walking into. And we can see what we've had to walk into. And there's not much difference. So a lot of stuff the disciples are related to, we can also relate. If I look around and work in Muscochief, there's so much work that needs to be done, not even there. I mean, you can look at inner city Red Deer. Every time I go to the inner city, I, I, I amaze myself at the amount of people on the streets. And I'm like, well, where, do they have hope? Do they know Jesus? Edmonton, Calgary, I was just in BC. We were at a family staff conference in Kelowna. And uh, last weekend, and the amount of people that were intense, and I'm like, do they know who Jesus is? Like, there's so much work that needs to get done. It's overwhelming. And if I were to identify with the disciples a little more, when Jesus says, "Take absolutely nothing," I go, "That is a difficult thing." Could you imagine going to Mexico on a building project to build a house and take nothing? You just take a van with a bunch of people and just say, "God's going to provide everything I need." Would we do that? I know, he says, take nothing. The other thing that is listed in here is distractions. This is one of the ones that always hits me. You know, whether you're in full-time missions or you're working in the church or you're working or you have a, a company or whatever it be, how many of us have distractions? It could be phone. Every once in a while I get those, those reminders of how often you use your phone the week before. Those are embarrassing. I'm like, all right, delete that notification because that's ugly. You know, we do that because it's, it's gross. We don't want that. How about our personal goals? You know what? In three years, I want to buy this place. So in three years, I want to have this car or and I want to build up my business and so on. I mean, not that it's bad, but are they distractions? Are they pulling us away from God? Now, the disciples are dealing with pride, and I can tell you that I deal with pride, and I can just about guarantee you that everybody else here deals with pride because 2,000 years from the time the disciples are walking to now, I'm pretty sure pride has not gone extinct. But we deal with it. We deal with this stuff in our hearts. The other one that, uh, as I said, always gets me is uh, the fed to the wolves. Lamb among wolves. If you are ever outside of our Christian circles and you talk about being a Christian or say the word Jesus, you are labeled pretty quickly. It is, it is not a great thing to be a Christian in today's day and age. It's not easy. Some of it is, is you know, because of uh, people's past and history. Um, I've sat down in circles where the church has done some incredible things, incredibly horrible things in the name of Jesus. And you want to feel like a lamb? Sit in a circle like that. Sit in a healing circle. And you sit there going, I am trying to represent Jesus, and this is the history and the trauma that they have. That'll make you feel pretty small pretty quickly. So the rejection that the disciples were being ready, getting ready to be able to feel, is a rejection we feel now. It happens. It is not popular to be a Christian. So 2,000 years from when the disciples are walking the earth till now, things have not changed. 
But yet, if we look deeper in these 24 verses, there is so much richness. There is so much grace. There truly is. This passage is absolutely loaded. We can actually start picking things apart and understand that it's actually an instruction manual for missions. We will skip over a lot, but I want to look at a few things. The first thing Jesus says is pray, right? And why does Jesus say pray? What is the point of prayer? Prayer builds a foundation, a strong foundation between us and God. It is how we build our relationship. Jesus is making sure we start off and everything we do on the right foot. Now, I've done it many times where I've not prayed before I started something. I just thought I'll do it on my own merit. It never works. What a flop. I am really good at that. We've been there. So Jesus is inviting us to pray. The other thing about praying is, is as we spend time in prayer and in God's word, we are able to decipher what God's will is. Maybe his will isn't for us to do this or, or go on this missions or to build this or expand here. Maybe it's not. He also gives us a little bit of a, a help and he gives us something specific to pray about. Praying is not something that we do very easy anymore. So he says, ask the Lord to send up more, harvest, more workers. Now, that's a pretty easy thing to do, and that gives us a little, bit of, a little bit of an ability to get into the praying habit. And I love what John says in uh, 1 John 5. He says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask according to his will, he will hear us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we had asked of him. Now, I'm pretty sure God's will is about sending workers in the harvest field. Right? There's something about Matthew, about a great commission, baptizing, you know. I'm pretty sure that's uh, pretty much God's will. You know, John said, pray for this. Pray for this. Jesus said, pray for this. About God's timing, I've prayed for 100 workers in Muscogee's, and they haven't happened yet. I'm aware of that. But I believe at some point they will. It's all in God's timing. The other thing God wants us to do is trust. Jesus has given us the ability to trust God. He said, um, take nothing. He wants us to rely wholly on him. And I mean, this is in everything that we do. He wants us to know that he'll provide everything we need to do his kingdom work. Now, we support race. Every, every cent that we need for ministry, whether it's hosting an event, our salary, everything is given to us by gifts. Everything. We have to fully rely on God to that he's going to provide everything that we need. And this is what Jesus is inviting us to do. Philippians 4 verse 9 says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not talking Joel Osteen, meet all your needs. I'm talking about meet our needs so that we can go and do God's work. The other thing that uh, Jesus gives us the ability to do and, and points us in is healing. God wants us to be whole. In here, Jesus commands the healing of the sick, right? He says, go into town and eat what is offered. Heal the sick. Heal the sick. This isn't just physical, okay? It's also spiritual. Because it says the kingdom of God is near you. God is near us. God is near the people we're ministering to. He wants a renewed relationship with the people. That's what God wants. That's what he always is after. He's after our hearts. Our healing is inside. Now in here, we have verses 17 and 19. We'll touch a little bit about this later on, but I'm just going to, just for us to start thinking about what this may mean, Jesus, or the disciples, uh, the messengers, sorry, says, Lord, the demons submit to us in your name. And then again in verse 19, Jesus says, uh, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. People are being healed. This is huge. This is being healed from the inside out, which is what is needed. Romans 12, verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That is what it is, renewal. Renewal is to be made new. Another one is uh, honor. God wants us to honor people. This is, um, Jesus says to us, put, 
um, or eat what is put in front of you, right? He says, uh, he says right there, eat what is offered to you. And this is huge. There's been a series of sermons written on this um, because of what this actually is trying to say. Now, I believe this is good news. Now, the reason why I believe this is good news is because the Jewish people had a lot of things that they were not allowed to eat. You know, pigs, snakes. And I'm not that I would ever eat a snake, but there's a whole list of things. But Jesus says, no, eat what is put in front of you. Our Western culture, like in Canada here, our European culture, our heritage, we have right and we have wrong, right? You can either blow through a stop sign. I just heard about a minister who was stopped in a speeding ticket or something or blew through a stop sign on his way here. I was speeding to get here too because I was late. And that's a right and wrong offense. You get a ticket for that. It's right and it's wrong. But the interesting thing is the Bible was actually not written in a right and wrong context. The culture of the Bible is written in shame, honor. Where it's not about what is right to what is wrong. It is about honoring when we, um, I was asked to come here, I, I, I was asking a bunch of things about what is the culture of this church? How do you guys do Lord's Supper? I mean, I could do it what I think is right or wrong, but it's not about what I think is right or wrong. It's about how is the culture, and I didn't want to offend anybody, how is the culture of this church so that I can honor this church? Jesus wanted the host to be honored. Paul said the same thing in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 27. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat what is put in place, eat whatever is put in front of you without raising question of conscience. What Jesus has given us here is not that it's a right or wrong issue. It's about how can we operate in the spirit of love. Not bound by what we think is right or wrong, not bound by our traditions of how we do things in the CRC or any of sort like that, but how do we operate in love? Now, this is also incredible because this is way before Peter's vision of that sheet coming down from heaven. This is before then, and Jesus is already starting to crack some of this stuff. Other thing that Jesus wants to know is that it's not about us. And that, this, is, this is good. He provides us with the ability to take the hook off of ourselves and put it on him. Verse 16, it says, you know, whoever listens to me, listens to you, listens to me, sorry, rejects you, rejects me. And basically, I love that Jesus tells us because he knows that we're limited. We cannot handle that pressure. As humans, if I had to know that, or if I had to put that pressure on me every time I talked to somebody, every time I witnessed, if they did not like me because of the gospel, it's my fault. If I had to live like that, that would be horrible. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 it's not about you. It's bigger than you. This is about me. It takes the pressure off of our shoulders. It gives us a way out. It means we can be free. And I love that. Power. Jesus is showing the, the, these messengers power. He wants, God wants us to know that he's in control. Verse 17. The, the disciples said this like with joy and almost like an amazement. Lord, even the demons. They didn't say, Lord, the demons submit to us. He said, even the demons submit to us. Now, I identify with the disciples in many ways. And I think how Jesus had said so often in his ministry, do you still not know how long do I have to be here? How long do I have to suffer with these disciples? And I, and I identify with that. I kind of laugh at that, but I also identify with that because I'm the same way. I often forget about how big God is. I mean, Jesus could have also said at this moment, you thick-headed people, but he didn't. Just gently reminded them, that he was given them authority. I have given you authority. It was a gentle reminder. And it shows us that God is in control. Despite all the things that Job was put through, he knew this. He, Job said in 12 verse 10, in his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. And then 42 verse 2, this is probably the most favorite part of the Bible when, Jesus, when uh, God puts Job in his place. I absolutely love that. And... Um, Job says in verse 42, verse 2, he says, I know that you can do all things and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. God is in control. He's got the power. Now we know that God is at work in the right hand, so I'm, a, I'm a, an analytical person. 
I take something and I like to apply value to it, numbers. I'm a numbers kind of a guy. And the reason why I do that is because if I see a one and I see a five, in my mind I know that one is lower than five. So because I'm a numbers guy and analytical, I want to put this into some context. Marco Trends, this is a statistic company. He says, right, they say right now that the world population is growing at a 0.83%. 0.83%. This is how we know that God's at work right now. Um, Kentucky Today, which is a Baptist magazine, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I looked for the CRC version, but I couldn't see the CRC version. But the Kentucky Today says that right now over 2.5 billion people are Christians worldwide. I don't know what, this, what, what the requirement is to be listed in that, but it doesn't matter. It says that 2.5 billion people are Christians. On the whole, in the world, Christianity is growing at 1.17%, which means that's 50% higher than the world's population growth. Now that says something. And then Christianity in Africa, which is the fastest growing region right now, is growing at 2.7%. That's double that of Christianity of the world, and it's three times that of the world's population growth. That's huge. But it has to do that, because Roman, Romans 11, Paul tells us that the Jews are going to have their hearts hardened until the right number of Gentiles have come in to know the Lord. But we also know the Jews are also turning also. If you guys ever do some watching, watch the Messianic, Messianic Jews, incredible what, what Jesus is doing in the Jewish world right now. But that is incredible. That growth is incredible. And wouldn't we want to be part of that here in Pinocchio? Do we want to be part of that? Jesus is inviting all of us to join. The 72 messengers is like the church. It's like a church. That's about the size of the church on, on reserve that we attend. And these 72, they were trained by Jesus, and he says, pick a partner, get out. Step out in faith. Learn all of these things that I'm trying to teach you. Now, the mission field is actually more than just about people who are going out. There's a lot of the logistics involved. If we want to actually look at all of the, the, the background things that are happening right now, okay, people pray. He says, before you even start, you need prayer, right? He says, go, pray to the Lord of Harvest. We need prayer. We always pray, right? Before you eat a meal, we have families, we have business. Hey, what do we want, God, what do you want us to do? We have to we start with prayer. Build a business, expand your business. It's done with prayer. Logistically, we had disciples, these messengers going out, and they had to stay with people. So they had people who needed to house them. They, they were part of the mission, they had people who needed to give them food, right? He said, don't take any food. Don't take any clothes. People were donating clothes, donating food, donating all so many things and praying. And praying. When I was here last in April, I had talked about the missional hope. And we had chatted a little bit about not every day is glorious or hopeful. It's not. Not every day is like, uh, man, I nailed it out of the park. As a matter of fact, it's probably quite often more not that way. But Jesus brings people around us and it's showing here. That's why you go with a partner. You go two by two. People are around us and they give us hope. They give us life. I can't tell you how often me and Becky have lied in bed and going at the end of the day going, I have no idea how we got through this day. I have no idea. But I do know. Because we have people surrounding us in prayer. We have people who, who give, people who, who are, are encouraging us. There is nothing like getting a text at like 2 o'clock in the morning for whatever reason, and I'm up counseling somebody, uh, whether it be a loss or something, and then I get a text from somebody who says, hey, praying for you, bro. Love you, man. And right at the perfect time I needed it. Unbelievable. And Jesus is inviting us to, do, to be part of this. I want to rejoice because missions is not just about going out as we talked about. It truly is the whole body of Christ's involvement. It needs to be the focus and execution of the whole church. And right now, Jesus in these 24 verses shows us an invitation. And the invitation that Jesus gives us is an invitation to pray, an invitation to trust, 
to honor others, to operate in the spirit of love, to remove the stress and the pressure that we put on ourselves in an invitation to see God's amazing power. These are the traits of a missional church. All of these gifts that Jesus has given us in this story bring us closer to our great creator. Now, I talked a little bit about some of the things about uh, stepping on demons. I'm just going to talk a little bit. It's important to understand that the demonic side of ministry is real. We don't talk about it in our circles. It makes us uncomfortable. I'm aware of that. But you have to expect it. There's oppositions. Anytime we walk closer with Jesus and with God, anytime we move in faith, man, the devil doesn't like that. He doesn't. And I get it because it scares him. But the beautiful thing is that Jesus reminds us he gave us authority over him if we believe it. And he is going to try to trick us. He tells us lies. You're not good enough. You can't do this because you can't speak. Look at Moses, right? How many times and um, Paul, all these other people who are like, oh, I can't be in this because this is not who I am. And, and we can believe all these lies. And Jesus says, no, don't believe these lies. I am in control. These gifts, pray, healing, trusting, honoring, and seeing God's power about being free. Jesus was teaching the disciples to rely on God. He was molding them for kingdom work, just as he is with us. Now we can look around and we can see and listen and hear about amazing things that God is doing in people's lives, whether it be in this church, whether it be outside the church, whether it be in Central Alberta, Africa, Asia, wherever. We can see incredible things. Because Jesus invites us to come along. Now the best part of all of this and this is something that I always, I stop and I, I absolutely am humbled by this because look what Jesus says at the very end of this passage. He turns to the disciples and says privately, blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you did not see. Or wanted to see, but did not see it. And hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Thousands of years prior to the disciples, and these messengers going out. Prophets prophesied about this time when the Holy Spirit would come on the people. And we're living in this time. Our eyes are blessed to be able to see this. To be able to hear the stories of how God works in people's lives. This gives us the opportunity to praise God. Humbly come before him and give him all of the glory. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you so much, God, for your word. We thank you so much for your son and his spirit, Lord, as it directs us, guides us, and moves us closer to walking with you, to understanding your incredible ways. I pray, Father, for anybody who is in here who has been talking, Lord, about um, being challenged and being um, stepped out, Lord, in faith. I just ask, God, that you may grant them wisdom. Father, grant to them peace. Lord, that as they move from this, um, from their, their comfort zone, God, that you have them. Father, I thank you so much for everybody here. I pray, Father, for your spirit's blessing on them today. And may your hand be on them, Father. We love you. We thank you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.